I mean, exactly. So, I'm not being recorded though yet, right? See? Oh, yeah. Or or move that one. You could even move this one over. Yeah, because I'm not going to need it. Nope. Nope. This is going to be so much fun to share today. I don't have any idea what it is. Just a little bit. Okay, perfect. Okay. Chris. Welcome. I have to give you a hug nice and thank you for coming. All right, now I've got, we could put, okay, are you good? Like put a chair, take one of the, roll one of those chairs. You can take that one because there's, this is one too. We're so glad you're here. I am too. You know, we've thought about it and then you confirmed Sherry, you snuck in in the back. <laughs> what? Oh, they are right now? Okay, good. We're live streaming this. <laughs> I know. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we're still not at 9 o'clock yet, so I'll wait a couple more minutes. Okay. You are exactly right. This is information and awareness and strategies that we have to have, like it or not. And this is as much about our brain health today as anybody else's. So we've got more people coming. <laughs> Reagan, can you go set up three more chairs? I've got three more people coming in. And we can put them around the table. Around, yeah, just facing. We can face. Good morning. We're setting up more chairs. Reagan's getting some, and we can just put them up, Jane. We can just stick, like, right here. Good morning. Thank you for coming. I'm Lori. Holly, Russo. Holly, nice to meet you. Hi, Hi nice to meet Sarah. you. You do? Yeah. Okay. Did you guys go to school together? Yeah. Well, she, I went to Lawrence North. Okay. And then we both just And then but, and from from Butler. Yeah. It's, can you believe that four years just yeah. did it go fast for you? Yeah, really fast. Really fast. Yeah. And Sarah's getting ready to move to Columbus, She's Mississippi, so smart. and oh, yeah. yes. And her fiance is in the Air Force. He's on the Air yeah. Force base down there. So I. I just got tears last night. It just kind of hit it's me. Crazy. I was just like, "You're too, it's too far. I know. And there's not a good way to get there. You know, you, you fly into, it's in the middle of nowhere. So you fly to Birmingham, Alabama, and that's not a direct flight. And then you have to drive two hours to Columbus. That's weird. So it's easier to drive. It's yeah. an eight and a half hour drive. It's faster to drive. So she's just driving then? So she's, she and Matt are going to take both their cars and then drive and... And, uh, yeah, oh, I am. T I think so too. Anyway, thank you so much for coming. This will be fun today. Yeah, you can just stick your yoga mat anywhere. Good for you to bring some snacks this morning. <laughs> I'm always eating, I feel like. <laughs> Hi, 
thank you for coming. Lori. Okay, nice to meet you. And there's a seat there, and there's, and we can, yeah. We might need a couple more. There's two more. I am like so excited about this turnout. This is unbelievable. Hi, honey. How are you? How are you? Good, Good to see you. you. Good to see you too. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Oh, I saw you were coming and I was just like, yay. And I am thinking that we are close. We probably should. I don't know. Doug, should I leave it open? or? I'll pass that right around. And okay. Come back around to me. I'll start entering all the names. And, you know, oh, my gosh. Okay. So it needs to go back around yep. because. Okay. I'm just wondering if. So do you, is, this, is this okay to have this open? Yep. Do you think that's not going to. Okay. I think we've got a couple more. Uh. Good morning. Thank you for coming. I'm going to bring, help your, there's a couple of chairs right here. Oh, there are two more back here. Hi. Thank you so much for coming this morning. This is amazing. No, no, no. I Let's go ahead and begin. I am just, you know when you create a Facebook event, and Saturday I am being very, those who know me know, I'm very honest. I was sitting on our screened-in porch, and this is my week of vacation, which Reagan laughs because that never happens, but this is not work for me. This is joy. And I thought to myself, as I'm learning this, I have to share this immediately. Um, so what I'm going to do this morning, two hours is no time at all. So I want to kind of tell you how this will unfold this morning and then what I would love for you to do with this. I would like to go over the, the research because in this time, educational neuroscience and mind-body practices are still being resisted in the West. I mean, there is still some discomfort for many people. But what I have created is a PowerPoint that is steeped in research from a textbook that I have been studying since our grad class. I'm looking at Anita and Trudy, and, and because this is what we're going to cover this fall in more depth. So, but I wanted to share this. This is about your brain health today as much as it is about the students you sit beside or your practice in whatever capacity you're in today, this is for you today. This is a gift for you. So I want you, we'll go over the research, then I'm gonna share some practices from Peter Levine and Dr. David Buccelli. These are brand new. Dr. Buccelli's work is very popular. It's called Trauma Releasing Exercises, TREE. You're gonna get all of this. I'm gonna send you the documentaries. I'm gonna send you the PowerPoint. Um, you've got the text and the author. So you will have all of this today. When, uh, you won't have it when you leave, but um, Doug White, who is graciously live streaming this for me today, is taking all the, there's an email list. Some of you have already um, signed it, so I'm going to send it around again, and he's going to put it in so that we can share all of this, because I won't be able to show all these documentaries and do all of this in two hours. But I want you to leave here excited and curious. And if you're uncomfortable with some of these practices, that's okay too, because what we know today is that adversity, and I want to use the word adversity and not so much trauma, because adversity happens on a continuum. So some of us have held some real anxiety and some real discomfort because maybe three years ago we were in a car accident. Maybe we even fell ice skating and our hand 
was injured because a blade ran over it. Do you see what I'm saying? The, these adversities can go from huge traumatic, um, you know, sexual abuse, domestic violence, significant neglect, but they can also be small ones. We could have a day where we have had four, do you remember the book Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day? That's a stress, that's an anxiety that needs to be released. So these practices, what I'm going to be doing in fifth grade this year at the lab school and with my undergraduate students and in our graduate class, we are going to be integrating these practices every time the class meets. You can use these in small groups, you can use these in whole class, you can use these for bell work. But whatever, you know, just make this your own and really think about how you can personalize and how you can um, integrate some of these practices. So this morning, I want to give you the research. And again, I'm going to use notes. And those of you who know me know I don't use notes very often. But I, this is new to me. So I want to make sure that I'm accurate in how I share this today. Also, um, everybody say hello to everybody across the United States. We are live streaming this today. And there are a couple of teachers in Switzerland that have tuned in today, too. So anyway, thank you. Oh, she is? Okay, so hello to Switzerland and to everybody, Kansas. Um, I have so many, uh, there are people that are going to be seeing this from everywhere. Come on in. So let's begin. Um, the text that is driving my work this summer is entitled um, "How Childhood Disrupted, How Your Biography Becomes Your Biology and How You Can Heal. Um, Donna is a science editor, but the research is from peer-reviewed journals in neuroscience, which are at the end of this PowerPoint. This is what I want to share. You can't see this, but I'm going to read this to you. When you take care of your brain, it takes care of you. The exercises we are going to be sharing today are going to be fascinating for students, from little ones up through young adults. And this is why. Our body has a tremor mechanism in this muscle called the sorus muscle. And that sorus muscle connects your legs, it connects your pelvis, and it connects your trunk. You can bend because of that sorus muscle. I mean, it really is the controller. And in the spine, and you'll have all this information, in the spine, in the gray matter of the spinal cord, are these tremor mechanisms, these generators. We're going to see a little introduction to this that actually connects the autonomic nervous system to the brain stem. And what we know is we all carry those negative emotions in the body. Bessel van der Kolk's work shares that. Peter Levine shares this. Bruce Perry knows this. And children and adolescents can't learn when they are holding on to those negative emotions. So my goal this year is to start every morning just for a couple of minutes with some of these exercises that I'm going to share with you today that actually release tension in the sorus muscle. Because the sorus muscle is our fight-flight muscle. It's what freezes up in chronic stress. So I just I want you to think about that today. Now some of these, because there's so many of us, I am going to probably do a shortened version of this exercise, but I'm going to show you the longer version too. And that's why I dressed in yoga pants today, um, because I'm going to be very courageous because <laughs> I'm learning this, and I'm going to show you what I'm learning, but I'm getting these tremors. He, okay, this is what I was going to tell you. The students will love this because this is what's going to happen. They are going to see when they take care and follow directives in that brain area, they're going to see their body work for them, which is the coolest thing. I literally, when I was doing this, my daughter Reagan is here this morning, and she and I have been doing this for the past week, off and on. My, when I say our body, have you seen dogs shake? Have you seen wild animals shake? We all, our natural tendency is to shake off stress and anxiety. The only two species that don't do this naturally are zoo animals and human beings because we've conditioned ourselves to not do that. In a gym, when, how many of you have worked out before and you've started shaking? When, a part of your body, when you're tense, when you've strained and you've used that muscle. I mean, I do it in yoga class when I'm holding different poses and I'll start to shake. 
And that's a very natural response in the body, but for whatever reasons, we have not um, aligned that with positive releasing emotion. Does that make sense? So let's go to the let's go to the biology of this. I wonder if my clicker works. Let me see. I'm not going to worry about it. So let's go to this. This is new for me this summer. And those of you who, how many of you are familiar with the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experience study? So this study was done over 22 years ago. It is aligning adversities, nine to ten categories to health outcomes in adults and children and adolescents. But we're looking at four individuals, and this is about your brain today. Many of us come in to, the, to our adult lives bringing in three or four or five adversities. What are those adversities? There are nine or ten of them that have been, and, and we're, I say nine or ten because we've added a couple more. But those adversities are, did you grow up in a family where there was a divorce? That's an adversity. Many of us have. Did you grow up in a family where um, there was significant poverty? Many of us did. Have you experienced someone that you've loved or someone you've lived with that's gone through mental or emotional illness? That's an adversity. Addiction is an adversity. Have anybody that you have been with in a caregiving or in a family situation, have they been incarcerated? Maybe you had a sibling that was in juvenile overnight. That counts. That's an adversity. Um, so these are adversities that affect our bodies in so many ways. I'm going to share this with you right now, and then I'm going to I'm going to go into a little bit of the science. Early chronic, unpredictable stressors, losses, and adversities we face as children shape our biology and predetermine our health. I want you to hear this. It is the unpredictable stress that is the most damaging to our health. What do I mean by that? When we don't know when we go home if we're going to eat, we don't know who's going to be there to care for us, we don't know if there's going to be anyone to tuck us in, if we don't know what to expect in our environment, that creates an elevated, activated stress response in that HPA axis, which is that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It's our stress response. When something catastrophic has happened and it's over, that's horrific too, but it's not ongoing. That unpredictable chronic stress is very, very critically damaging to the stress response system, especially in children and adolescents. Do you know why? because it's continually <coughs> developing. Just like the brain, that HPA axis is developing all the time. I mean, it's, it's going through development. The brain is the only organ that we have that where we come into the world and it's underdeveloped. So that HPA, our stress response system is developing and that's why this concerns me, is that when we have seven and eight and nine and 12 and 15 year olds who are coming in with elevated, activated stress response systems, that is damaging and it's compromising healthy brain tissue and healthy body tissue in that stress response. So stress also erodes those protective caps at the end of chromosomes and we laugh at our house because I, and those of you who know me, I always talk about are my telomeres getting shorter? And those are those ends, you know, that with increase. And there have been studies with um, mothers and, or parents of children in special education. They've done studies where um, when those telomeres become shorter and they are diminishing on the ends of chromosomes, it creates accelerated aging. So um, let's take a look. I, this is called, this is the new theory of everything. And this is all, this is all um, cited in the back of this PowerPoint. This is the correlation between childhood adversity, brain architecture, and adult well-being. And your immune system is your operating system. It, it's, it really controls everything. Our emotional biography becomes our physical biology. And the early stress we face when we are young catches up with us 
affecting our DNA, affecting our immune systems, and affecting brain development and brain tissue. So this is not a warm, fuzzy extra. And those of you who want more of this research, I would really love for you to read Bessel van der Kolk's work in The Body Keeps the Score because his work shares deeply how trauma and adversity are held in the body, not just the brain. Take a look at this for a minute. Stress causes the brain and body to marinate in toxic inflammatory chemicals. What I want to share with you, which is on the next slide, is something that when I was reading this text, I just kept saying, wow. I mean, I just, I was shocked by what I was reading. And here is what I found. We have about 180 to 100 billion neurons, but we, in our brains. And there's, our, I mean, so I've heard 23 billion. 36 billion, 80, but what, we have a lot. <laughs> so, but that is just part of the story. We have 10 times as many glial cells. And those glial cells were thought in the past to not be so significant. They were thought to really, you know, create better communication, to support the neurons in synaptic connections. But as I was reading this, there's a special cell called a microglia cell. And this cell is good, and it's meant to increase. When we talk about synaptic connections, we know learning happens when the axon becomes myelinated, meaning it gets that protein coat that kind of acts as an electrical insulator. So messages, you know, what you learn well stays with you. The glial cell is, it helps in that way. It's a great, it's a, it's a cell that um, is great for cell-to-cell -cell communication. But the stress response system creates havoc on these microglial cells. And these microglial cells now, we are seeing the beginning of cell death in the hippocampus just as neurogenesis happens, so just as, as these new cells are being generated in the hippocampus, which is our memory, right? This is where we remember the hippocampus sits next to the amygdala. We see cell death because those microglial cells are just running wild. And they literally repel and create havoc when the stress response system is elevated and activated. As a teacher, I need to know this. And for my older students, I want to share this with them. Someone said to me after a presentation, Lori, we got to take care of our hippocampi. And I thought, that needs to be a t-shirt. <laughs> I mean, that, that more so than the amygdala, maybe. I don't know. But um, So I want you to think about that. So I'm, I, I want you to look at this slide. Emotions can be powerful and we feel them physically, powerful relationships between mental stress and physical inflammation, all disease. There isn't a disease on this planet that is not intimately connected to inflammation in the body or brain. And the research now shows that the brain, when it has those microglial cells running crazy and wild, and when there are cytokines, and those are those proteins, those molecules that are actually good. They're, they come from white blood cells. When those cytokines are um, trying to kill and diminish the disease in our bodies, when our stress response is elevated, they can't do their job. So we literally are seeing these health outcomes based on brain architecture, based on our neurobiology and these um, circuits and cells that are not running and working properly because of this HPA, this stress response. So cytokines are cell signaling proteins that aid or help cell-to-cell -cell communication in immune responses, stimulating movements of cells towards sites of inflammation and infection and trauma. But what happens when we have cortisol and adrenaline running crazy in our bodies, 
They can't do that. They can't take care of the disease. So as a teacher, as a counselor, as a practitioner, as a pediatrician, we need to understand that and know that. Now, what I want you to do is, I get so excited, so I want you just to turn to somebody right now. And I want you to tell them your best, most favorite takeaway from these first 20 minutes. And then the other person, as you listen, kind of give your response, share yours, and then maybe a question that you have. But you know what I'm going to ask you, those of you who know me. So what you're going to do is as you speak, one of you, decide who's going to talk first. So find a group of two or three. Find who's going to talk. You know what's going to happen. You get 30 seconds. Now, here's what you're going to do. The person that's talking, you, as you talk, I want you to move your hands and arms any way you want to across your face. I mean, anyway, just keep, but you have to keep moving and talking and just keep them moving across your face, okay? But you have to share your takeaway or your question for 20 seconds, that's it, or 10. And then I'm going to, we're going to switch. Go. Just don't punch the person across from you. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to bring you back. Now, the person, the person who was um, just, you know, so grateful that they were just listening, it's your turn. And um, so what you're going to do is you're going to share something maybe from these first 22 minutes that you could immediately take into your practice or into your classroom or building or community. So something from this that immediately you can think of, oh, I, this is something I have clarity with. I can share this right away. You know, this is something I can do. And as you do that, you are going to snap going in all different directions, all over. Snap as you talk. Ready? You've got about 10 seconds. Go. Okay, I'm going to bring you back. Okay, that was awesome. You guys are great sports. Excellent, excellent. Now, what I want to share with you, Dr. Peter Levine's work talks about some some strategies we can put into place immediately. I'm, I love to just, I'm going to throw them out right now. I'm going to not save them for the end. This is not tree, but these are a couple of strategies from Peter Levine's work. And this is what he says that I just, I was telling Michael McKnight as I was driving to Butler this morning, I, I found this fascinating. He says our bodies are containers. And our ability to generate movement automatically is a gift that we have denied and we've not recognized. So thinking, this is something I can teach my students. I asked you to think of something you could take. This is my takeaway. Our body is a container and it holds our emotions and it holds our feelings and our, you know, our thoughts. And so when we start to feel agitated and irritated, and you can see that child or adolescent reaching or beginning to reach that point of no return. Not, they're not there yet. I want you to take your left hand. I want you to put it under your arm. And I want you to take your right hand and put it on your shoulder. And then just kind of feel that hug. And as you do this, I, you can just kind of rock back and forth. I just want you to take, and you don't have to write, just whatever feels good. And I want you just to take a couple of deep breaths. You can just close your eyes. And feel 
just the gift, I mean, the beauty of your container. I mean, this body and brain of yours has plasticity. And it has the ability to change and heal and repair every moment of every day. And this is what we want our students to know. I mean, this is a gift. So go ahead and just take a couple more deep breaths. And now what I'd like for you to do, kind of shake it out. And here's another option. Putting your hand on your forehead and then putting your other hand on your chest, on your heart. And I just want you to take a couple more deep breaths and just feel, just kind of feel, again, the beauty of your brain and your body, that beating heart and your pulsating electrochemical brain that just serves you so well. And then I want you to take your hand off your forehead and move it down to your belly, keeping your other hand on your heart. And take a couple more deep breaths and just feel that you are in this room today. You are safe and you are present. Your heart's beating. Mine's beating fast. You've got a nice breath. And whatever has happened... Right now, you are safe and contained, and your body is doing the work for you and your brain. One more deep breath. Kind of shake it out. <coughs> now, I want you to stand up, and I know we're crowded, and just take the stretch you need. That's a lot of sitting, and I want to tell you <clears throat> that if you need, we're really crowded in here, but if you need to use the restroom or just to stand or move, you know, please get up and just take, take care of yourself. Take whatever you need. Um, while you're standing, I want to share with you, um, and those who have attended my uh, professional developments and mostly the coursework here at Butler, know we're beginning to talk about epigenetics. And this is the new science, of this, of, for, uh, this is the best news for us in this time. And epi stands for above the gene. So what we're learning is that our genotype really means nothing. And we have this incredible knowledge and research now that shares the significance of relationships and environment on how genes are expressed. And what concerns me, and I want to use a better word, what challenges me is the research from this summer. And I want to explain to you. Put your arm out. A very simple, we're not neuroscientists here, but your arm represents your DNA. And if you had a long sleeve on, that sleeve would represent the protein that covers that DNA. And that DNA plus protein is, is in your chromosome. And for that DNA to be red, that protein, that chromosome, needs to have methylation markers, chemical markers that are healthy. Methylation is when an experience, a relationship, any event in life can create toxic markers or they can create healthy markers on the protein. And it determines the way the protein is expressed. And again, this is, oh my gosh, a neuroscientist would be shaking his head at me right now because I'm giving this in a reel. But basically what we know is that when those markers get blemishes, when they get blemished, that DNA cannot express itself in the way that it needs to when we talk about healthy adult outcomes. This is important for us to know and to teach students in a lexicon they can understand. This is epigenetics. Go ahead and have a seat. So let me just read this. Methylation is our DNA is wrapped up tightly in protected proteins which make up our chromosomes. Our genomes really don't matter. It's how they are expressed. For genes to be expressed properly, the chromosome has to be unwound and it has to be opened up like a flower. It will not blossom. It will not bloom with those toxic blemishes. 
which can be that elevated and that um, activated ongoing chronic stress response that leaves markers on our DNA. Does that make sense? So this is, again, the biggest concern for me as a teacher. Those chemical markers or methyl groups, they are finding in hippocampi area. And what's happening is that the hippocampus is the CEO of our adrenal glands. Its job is to stop the stress response. But the hippocampus cannot do its job when there are elevated levels of glucocorticoids, which are the part of those receptors, those dendrites in that hippocampus. That hippocampus is made to stop the stress response. And when there's ongoing cortisol, those glucocorticoid receptors become diminished and they wither away. That's what I'm talking about with chemical markers. So those chemical markers adhere to specific genes that are supposed to govern the activity of the stress response and regulate that stress response, and they can't. What does that mean for a child's ability to learn? What does it do? Shout it out. Shuts it down. It compromises. They can't memorize. They are struggling with um, regulation. They're struggling with cognition. I mean, it affects all areas. But that hippocampus works with the amygdala. So their ability to even regulate, to remember, to process information is compromised. And my girls hate this picture of the seahorse. Do you remember this? They think it's gross. But this is a real picture of um, a hippocampus knowing how much it looks like a seahorse. So when a young child faces emotional adversity or stressors, cells in the brain release a hormone that actually shrinks the size of the brain's developing hippocampi, altering the child's ability to process emotion, manage stress, and remember. That's critical for us to know. The higher the ACE, the smaller the cerebral gray matter or brain volume in the prefrontal cortex, amygdala, and all sensory association areas like motor and sensory systems in the brainstem are compromised when there's elevated and activated stress. I'm going to tell you the good news in a minute. Oh, I, good. I, we already talked about the microglial cells. Now, we're going to get down to strategies here in a minute, but I want to share this piece to you. And I know this is the worst PowerPoint because you're only supposed to put a few words in one. <laughs> but I was so excited to share this with you since Saturday. So this is, I had to share it all. And I'm, I'm going to, I want to go skip. I want to go, these are the strategies. So you're going to get, you're going to get this. And then these are the resources um, from our peer-reviewed neuroscience journals. So, um, and I probably am going to add to this, but here is what concerns me, and it's all right here. What happens between, those of you who know me and just shout it out, what happens between 10 and 14 and 15? That is huge in adolescent. Walt, what happens in that? Or gray, go ahead. Gray matter. Pruning. Yeah. So proliferation of gray matter, you know, consolidation of white matter. I mean... This is the second greatest time of brain change. So starting in fourth or fifth grade, and I've been saying this forever, we see gray matter begin to be pruned away as white matter. White matter are those myelinated axons. And so we see students beginning to have 50 to 80% of gray matter pruned away, pruned back after that there's a big rush at about 11 or 12 of gray matter. It's like there's a, you know, lot, it comes in, and then after 11 or 12, then it's, it begins to get pruned away because what you use gets strengthened and you keep it, but what, gets, what you stop doing, whether you've stopped reading, whether you've stopped sports, whether you've stopped exit, whether you've stopped going to yoga, whether, whatever you've done in those years gets pruned away. And this is the best news we can tell our students at, who are nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. We, they need to know this. 
But here is what I've learned this summer. That part of development is clear to us. We understand that the adolescent brain is vulnerable, that it goes through the second greatest time of brain change. But what happens to that student when they are not only going through normal adolescent development, but they also have a chronic stress response happening at the same time? What is that doing to cell death or cell neurogenesis cell growth? So you've got Jim with 800 neurons and synapses, and you've got John with, they all start out with that many. Now, adolescent development says you prune away half, so they should both be at 400, right? But what about the young man, John, who is literally losing those synaptic connections and experiencing cell death because of ongoing stress. He comes out of the adolescent period with 200 or 100 compared to 400. So it's a concern because in that time, that pruning is natural, but what's getting pruned away are good, healthy connections and neurons that we need, especially in the hippocampi. And that's basically what that says. So um, we're going to move on. And um, I want to, okay. What I'd like for you to do is um, just stand up and give yourself just some deep breaths and a stretch. And I'm going to pull up. I, I know, are you, should we turn the air down? Is it a little hot in here or is it me? I'm always hot, so is it, is it okay? Because we're gonna get we're gonna get busy with our strategies here in a minute, but I want to show you a couple what we're gonna be doing. So I'm gonna begin with Robert Sapolsky's, and my graduate students saw this this summer. But this six minutes is critical for us to see as we begin this tree exercise. And so I, I want to share. Robert Sapolsky was actually at Butler this year. And we got to see him. The Woods series brought him in. And um, he is going to share with you a rat study, but stay with me till the end of this because this is the best news for us as teachers, as counselors, social workers, and clinicians. So he's, he gives an excellent example of epigenetics and what we can do to calm the stress response, open up prefrontal cortex functioning, and help cleanse the body of negative emotion. I'm going to emphasize the body today. So um, go ahead and have a seat. And let's take a look at this. Okay. This is work done by a guy at McGill University named Mike Lamine. And what he was focused on is what started off as a very artificial literature, which is take yourself a newborn rat, and for the first two weeks or so of its life, every day you pick it up for three minutes and you pet it. And now you put it back. And all else being equal, it will have a Can you hear it? Okay. brain, adulthood, better learning abilities, more resistance to a whole bunch of neurological insults, lower glucocorticoid levels, etc. That whole world of what came to be known as neonatal handling. On the other hand, pick up the rat, take it away from mom, for instead of three minutes, an hour and a half, then each day, put it back, and as an adult, it's going to have a smaller brain under shorter life expectancy, three minutes away from mom, but he wonders, an hour and a half of being headed does not. That in and of itself is interesting in terms of what can Okay, so hooray, what we've just learned is just how generations of rat petting graduate students can influence the lineages of rat brains and all of that. And what Mimi started looking at with this phenomenon being one that was around forever, first identified around 1960 by a guy named Seymour Levine in the psychiatry department here, no longer alive. But that started this whole world of neonatal handling. What Mimi did was say, well, rats did not involve whatever is going on here for the purpose of doctoral theses. What's the world, what's the natural equivalent in the world of a rodent? And it turns out that what happens when you pick up a rat for three minutes and do this and put it back, mom is all excited and goes and checks out the pup and nuzzles it and nestles it and 
licks it and whatever other stuff there and has all this attention. Whereas if you take the pup out for an hour and a half, when you put him back with mom, mom basically ignores the pup for long periods of time. You're changing the mother's behavior. Okay, so that's an indirect effect. And what he proceeded to show was the critical thing about the handling was not what you're doing to the rat during that time, it's the fact that you're causing dramatic changes in maternal behavior based on that. So that's interesting, but that still doesn't solve the problem of why did the system evolve for grad students manipulating maternal behavior. And what he then proceeded to look at was normal variation in rat mothering styles, because some rat mothers are okay, I know this is a value judgment, but some rat mothers are better mothers than other mothers. Some rat mothers, they simply are better. They're better, they're nicer, they have better souls. And in these rat mothers, how do you determine that by these sorts of measures? Licking and grooming. How much time do you spend licking your baby? And how much time do you spend grooming your baby? And what me proceeded to show is that's what the neonatal handling phenomenon was about. When you have moms who lick and groom their kids an awful lot, what you do is produce the same sort of better outcome from the three minutes of petting deal there. You get the kid who is bigger and healthier and smarter, that sort of thing. Moms who hardly ever lick and groom their pups, they produce pups that as adults are like the ones that were separated for an hour and a half a day. It is a reflection of mothering style in the rats and the variability there. Next thing he showed was that this was multi-generational. If you lick and groom your baby rat daughter a whole lot, as an adult, she will be more of a licker and groomer. And he's already shown what some of the neurological mechanisms are for that, for development. What have we got? Yet again, one of these non-Mendelian inheritance of traits deals going on, in this case, not even prenatal, your early experience is going to cause lifelong changes in your brain, which will make you more likely to reproduce the same early experience for your offspring, off you go. The final thing he did, which stands as a landmark in the field of behavioral neurobiology, is he figured out what the epigenetic change is. One of them, or rather two of them, is identified by now. What gets changed by how mom often or unoften licks you, grooms you, all of that, you change the access of transcription factors relevant to making genes, to activating genes for making receptors for stress hormones, making receptors for estrogen making receptors for a whole bunch of different hormones, showing the epigenetic changes there, that's how you go from mom's differing maternal style to lifelong differences in expression of all sorts of genes. How's this? What you wind up seeing there as this permanent mechanism, it is also reversible, what he has since shown which is you have a baby rat who spends the first half of its infancy with some totally terrible, negligent, distracted mom who pays no attention, doesn't do any work. Now, cross foster the pup to a more attentive mother and you can change the epigenetic pattern. So all of this has two things going on. Early experience causing really persistent differences in how this stuff works long after, and experience later on having the potential to reverse some of this. All of this stuff, once again, would be mistaken for genetic. What we have here is what appears to be a genetic style of what sort of mother rat you are, and it's not genes, it's the mothering style setting up the offspring for being a similar type of mother. This is so exciting because the last minute shares that you can take a child and he goes on I mean there's been research with orphanages there have been there's there are research not just about rat pups but what we know is that we the resiliency research is very very clear in that you can have a child an adolescent coming from a very toxic environment but that does not have to be the end story and we know that connection and relationships change brain architecture and the trajectory of well-being, emotional, social, 
and physiological, therefore cognitive well-being. So those small strategies, those small practices that you may be thinking does not make a dent, makes a huge dent. And it is a part of the epigenetic um, factor. And literally helping and sitting beside children and adolescents <laughs> who have this beautiful brain, who don't have to be their genetic biology. It doesn't have to be that. And that's the exciting pieces. Jill Bolte-Taylor says the best news for us in education right now is that three areas. We have neuroplasticity, and then we have this incredible human ability to connect relationships, and mindfulness changes brain architecture. Mindful strategies literally changes the way the outcomes are. So I want to get into the strategies. And what I'd like to do is I would like to, um, I, before we even begin, I, I'm just trying to think of how I want to do this. I think it would be good, let's just kind of review a little bit about the brain. For the, so there are some people that have not been with me before, so let's just talk about why we're doing tree today, because I'm doing great on time. Um, let's talk a little bit about neuroplasticity, and let's talk about adversity and trauma and where it lands in the brain. So let's, let's go back. Uh, this part of the brain is what? Prefrontal cortex. When does this, what, why do we have this part of the brain? What does it do here? So executive function, um, and this is the newest part of the brain. It's the last part of the brain to develop. This is where our abilities and skills to emotionally regulate, to pay attention, to problem solve, to make decisions, to have, to look at linear consequences. This part of the brain is where we do life and where we do school. The brain develops from the back to the front and from the inside out. So we have those two almond-shaped clusters deep in each temporal lobe sitting next to the hippocampi in each temporal lobe. So what are those right here? Shout it out. The amygdala. And it's our fight, flight, freeze response. We're teaching students this. Those of you who have not been with me, everything I'm sharing right now, we are teaching students as young as five and six years old. They know, they say, they love the way the word amygdala sounds in their mouth amygdala. They love that. They love neuroplasticity. They love to know what happens in their brains. So what we know is that that amygdala is really the seat of emotion. It's not just negative emotion. I want to be clear on that. The, the fight, this amygdala is our emotional switching station. It holds positive emotion too. And actually the stress response starts here in the brain stem in the area right Right, it, it's, it's called a blue area, actually. That's the technical name, and it's called the locus ceruleus, and that's where all stimuli enter into the brain, comes right into the brain stem, and then it moves to the sensory cortices. But everything in our environment, Judy Willis talks about the reticular activating system. So that's our alert, our awake system. Are we, you know, what do we pay attention to? Everything comes in there except the sense of what? Smell. So that sense of smell actually doesn't have to go through those different cortical areas. It goes right to the limbic system. How many times have you smelled something and it's brought a memory up like that? You know, you just, I mean, it's just, it creates that. So why, why are we talking about this today? The right hemisphere is the seat of where our trauma and adversity lands. Why is that? We're not left or right brain, so don't leave here thinking we're not left or right brain, but that right hemisphere holds emotion. It comes on board the first year of life. The left hemisphere has not come on board yet. But it holds emotion. It holds implicit, unconscious memory. It holds visual images. And that's where a lot of our trauma lands. That's why a four-month-old baby can have dire, significant behavioral issues when he or she turns four or five and you would think, but at four months old, how could that trauma have affected that baby? But what we know is the brain is the most plastic and most malleable 
from the last trimester or a little before up through the second year of life. This is Alan Shore's research along with Linda Chapman's research. So that first, those first two years of life, that brain doesn't say, oh, I want this, or oh, that's good for me, or oh, I like that. In those first two years, that brain takes in everything it's exposed to. Good, bad, right, or wrong. It just takes it all in like Velcro. So we can have 18-year-olds and 16-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 25-year-olds who are coming in and maybe their life has been going very, very well, but maybe there was significant trauma or adversity in those first two years. Not that, not that we can't change because that's neuroplasticity. We can't. It just is harder when there's been significant adversity in those first two years. So these exercises and these strategies and techniques today are to activate right hemisphere, to release, kind of loosen up that hard circuitry negative emotion because we don't have the words for terror. You know, what is, what's that old saying, I was scared to death or what's, I was wordless? Isn't there something about you don't have the words for something? Uh, I'm trying to think of what? Speechless. Literally, that is, I mean, we, it's true. Because we don't sometimes, we lose our words. The Broca and Wernicke's area over here don't come on board till the second year of life. And what we know is in significant adversity, those areas in the brain shut off and shut down. They're not functioning when we don't, when we're in significant stress. That's why I, you know, remember, you, know, you all know at my presentations, I always say nobody in the history of being told to calm down has ever calmed down because it just doesn't work that way. So when we talk about these strategies today, when we pull out, and, and it's great, if you didn't bring a towel or you didn't bring a yoga mat, no worries, we've got carpet. But I, I, I want you to know that what we're doing is we're releasing negative emotion even when, even when we, when, even this, is a technique. You know, even that. Um, so I'm going to go through some, I, I want to teach you tree, but then I'm going to go through the list of strategies on the PowerPoint because I want you to have a whole, just all of them to choose from. A smorgasbord of body, mind, um, research-based strategies. So Dr. Bocelli, um, go ahead and stand up and put your hands right here. This right here, this is the sorus muscle. I was calling it the sore ass muscle, yeah. which, which I kind of like that better. But the sorus muscle here, um, Dr. Bocelli explains, is that fight or flight. That's where we can hold a lot of that tension in that muscle that affects, you know, all kinds of aches and pains. Um, because it really is that muscle, as I said at the beginning today, that connects our trunk to our pelvis um, you know, to the upper body. So, you know, you think of bending, you know, you think of moving, and the sorus muscle is also where we hold on to tension. So this is my gift to you today, and what I want you to do is I want you to, we'll, we'll do some modifications today, but I want you to leave here today and get so excited that you're going to do this. You, you have to promise me you're going to try this. You've got to do this every day. Because at, this is for you. When your brain state is regulated, when your brain is calm, you it's, it makes a world of difference in the, the classroom culture. It really is not about our students this morning. It's about your brain. So when you go into a relationship calm and regulated, everything changes because emotions are contagious. And the kids will pick up on that. Here's the second piece of this. You've got to be excited about this. I mean, you just got to be really, really excited about this. You got to fake it, you know, even if you think this is. I, I said to Reagan, um, you know, I, and I was, Deanna um, was here earlier this morning, and I thought, you know, it, these positions, doing these exercises will be different for many of us. So, and it, and it feels unfamiliar to the brain. So it's going to feel, might feel weird. But you're, I'm going to get you to tremble this morning. I mean, you're really, I'm going to get you to do this automatic, so you're going to see the power of your brain a little bit. So I have to be careful how I say that. I'm going to make you tremble. Um, so, um, 
But anyway, we don't laugh enough, right? Um, we are just way too serious. We won't be serious in this last half. So anyway, this sorus muscle is where this fight flight and where the tension is held. So I am going to show you just a couple of minutes. Dr. Buccelli is going to, I'm going to send this video to you, so don't worry when I stop this. You're only going to see it for two minutes. And then I'm going to walk you through these steps. But he's going to share with you what happens in the brain, the spinal cord, and the brain stem as it moves, because he can do a much better job than I can of this. And then I'm going to show you high school students in South Africa, 350 of them in a huge gymnasium going through this training. So go ahead and have a seat. And then we're going to move the tables back and we're going to begin. Okay, so here is just the condensed. I just want to show you this real quickly here. Just, and you'll get this video, so I, you'll have this. In this short video, I want to give a brief explanation of the tension and trauma releasing exercise process which tries to express both its simplicity and its complexity. The exercises are designed to mildly stretch and stress certain muscle groups. And that's the purpose. For and they start with the feet and the ankles, and then move up to the calf muscles, and then the quadricep muscles, the adductors and hamstring muscles, and then into the psoas muscle. Now it's important to stop here and mention the psoas muscle since it's integral to the tension and trauma releasing exercises. The psoas muscles actually insert in the top of the femur, or which is the top leg bone. And then they move through the pelvis up into the spine, which is actually their origin, and they attach to the front of the lumbar vertebrae of the spine. The psoas muscle, or the psoas major, is the only muscle that connects the legs and the pelvis and the trunk of the body. That's why it's particularly significant. It has been recognized by many professionals that tightness in the psoas muscle is often what creates pain in the lower back, the neck, and the shoulders. Since it is also considered the fight or flight muscles, chronic contraction of this muscle tends to keep the nervous system on high alert. After we have exercised these particular muscle groups, the last exercise is to lay on the floor and pick up the pelvis, which stretches the core body muscles, so that now we've moved all of the muscle groups from the feet all the way up through the legs, pelvis, and into the back and up to the shoulders. Now what does this produce? The stretching helps to activate what's called central pattern generators. Now central pattern generators move up through the spine in a process called crosstalk. Central pattern generators are networks of neurons located inside the gray matter in the center of the spinal column. And the central pattern generators are responsible for the tremoring mechanism moving up through the spinal column and into the brain. Once the stimulus... Now, I'm going to stop that because this is, you're going to have this. So... I, I, you know, I want to go ahead. He talks about this beautiful loop of afferent neurons and efferent neurons. So you see this loop from its spinal cord activity from these generators, these um, groups of neurons in the gray matter in the spinal cord that literally travel up the spine into the brain stem and then back down around. So you go from body to brain and brain to body. And what I am thinking about, and I again, you're getting this as I'm learning this, I'm wondering how I can share this with 10 and 11 year olds. 
So I'm thinking about it. You know, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, and, and, and I want your ideas. So after you're here today, if you, when you go home and, again, what we're going to do is for you today. You know, I'm going to show, I'm going to take you through the series for your, and you got to practice it because I got, you get more tremors and this, and I can't tell you, it feels like, it just feels like the biggest high when you do this. It feels so releasing, we, but you got to practice this. You got to allow your body to shake and to release that tension. And I put music on when I do it, but for the children, for our students, they can do shortened versions of this. They can get a little shaking in their thighs, and I'm going to show you how to do that, knowing that they can control. I have this incredible power over my brain. I can make my body do this when I am intentional. So think about how powerful that would be for students to see what they can create when they're following a set of directives and how powerful their brain is to move their body automatically. You know, to do that. I, so this is, this is really, this is why I get excited about this. So I want to show you just real quickly the, um, I want to show you these high school students in South Africa. This is one minute. And again, I'm going to send you all of this. So um, here we go. Take a look. South Africa. Africa. We had the rare invitation by Sharon Johnson and the Belgravia High School to come and teach TRE to the students. We had about 300 students in a giant gymnasium, and we had the great fun of teaching them TRE. because of cultural and social differences, <laughs> and then we simply guided them through the exercises as a way of demonstrating that you can do trauma-releasing exercises with large populations of people who experience stress and trauma as part of their daily life. Once they did the standing exercises, the next thing to do is to lay down on the floor to activate the tremor mechanism so that they could passively allow the tremors to travel through the muscle tissue of the body and feel the effects. What is also important for us is that we went around giving every student some individual and personal attention. We wanted to make sure that they knew they were seen by us. Exercises, we let them lay down and rest for a little bit so that they could reintegrate from the work they did and come back to a very conscious state of mind so they could walk out feeling integrated and relaxed. Then we simply close by thanking them for being there, thanking the school for allowing us to be there. It was an amazingly rich and fun opportunity, both for the students and for ourselves, and we were able to demonstrate how you can get a whole school system to relax from stress and trauma. So, one of the things that drew me to this over the past week is that many of our students struggle with meditation or focused attention practices. It's hard for them to not move and just be still and focus on their breath. Now, everything, we, we had a meeting at the lab school this week, two new fifth grade classes. It's taught as a procedure. It becomes a part of your daily routine. So it's, you know, that part is, and your enthusiasm again creates the culture, the ecology of that classroom. But 
I, as I was thinking about this sitting on the porch and practicing this, I like this because for me, it's I my mind gets distracted and I've been trying I've been doing focused attention practices forever. But I still have a cloud of distraction when I'm just still. And it's better for me. That's why I like EFT tapping, which I'm gonna we're gonna talk about today. And that's why I like this practice because it's movement and breath. So today you're gonna move in breath, you're going to strain and stretch some muscles, not to the point of pain. Listen to your body this morning, but we know that movement and breath regulate the stress response system. It's research-based, and for me, movement is as critical as breathing. I just learned that over the summer. You know, I mean, I'm just thinking, you know what, I, Lori, you do need to move, um, because breathing in itself just doesn't always calm me down. So that is a part of this. So let's take a five minute break, go to the restroom or seven minutes, whatever. I'm gonna move these tables back. Take what you need. <laughs> and, um, and we're gonna move the tables back and, we're just, and we'll be all cozy. Um, we'll leave that door open and yeah, let's just, uh, we'll rearrange here for a minute. Okay, yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes. So is the goal of this for them to walk away going, here's a technique.
Okay. Right by you. Perfect. I'm glad you did too. And really, truly, we can sit in chairs, kind of squish together. We can even keep, we can even move, yeah, we can even move a couple tables even back further. Or outside even. I'll be, yeah. That's a good idea. So, um, what I want to show you is this polar bear. And Peter Levine, this is from Peter Levine's work. I really encourage you to look at his somatic sensory um, exercises too. And wh what I did with you earlier, this one, under the arm and this, this is Peter Levine's research. Also, another um, research, and I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions. You're going to have all these strategies, but another one that's nice, and I didn't even know this, and we did this for focused attention practices at the lab school, is I had the students put their hand, put their fingers on their vocal cords to keep them present in the moment. And so I would go, they would have to, we would do funny sounds, like we would mimic, so ah, ooh, ah, ee. And you can really feel that in the kit, the little ones, and even, I mean, they just had so much fun with that. And never did they lead it by themselves, because in fifth grade, your peers, that's just not safe. But they would do it as a group, and then they would mimic. So that's another way to, to release anxiety and to have students, because part of this is not just releasing anxiety, but it's being in the present, because trauma puts you either in the future, you're worried about when will this be over? Who can I trust? And um, yeah, or the past. You're not in the present moment. So those type of things help also executive function with sustained attention. So you know, you're paying attention to that. So I'm gonna put this video up of the polar bear, but try this right now, just because there's so many of us, no one will hear you. So try a couple of fun sounds and see what you feel in your throat. So try it. Louder. Try it louder. Oh, I like the loud. So open today to trying things. All right, let's take, I put this to minute 11. So take a look at this polar bear um, and, and how this polar bear begins to regulate after a very stressful fight flight experience as he's chased by a helicopter. And, and so this is a little of, um, th th these are the tremors we're talking about.
watch that animal after he finishes convulsing, you'll see, because he's aware of the fact that we're all around him, and it's a very stressful experience for an animal like a polar bear. Come after he settles down, and then he'll start doing a couple of deep breaths, and then he'll breathe really nicely, and he'll rip. I go, here he goes. See how he's breathing me now? So even though it looks a little unpleasant, it like that. It lets off all that stress, and, and he then is able to relax and, and uh, sleep the thing off. I'm going to send you... In t um, I mean, it may be too much information, but I, it's up to you. But I'd like to, for you to see Peter Levine's work. He he goes ahead and talks about this. And I know that's hard to watch, but it's a great illustration of how you saw a wild animal literally in that, I mean, you can't be more um, stressed. And then how that body takes care of that brain and how that bear is able to then regulate and return to a homeostasis um, state after such trauma. Yeah. So yeah. In the in our worlds where we're working with children that are growing coming from these toxic environments, and let's say a child has gone through an incredible morning filled with stress, and we know the child well enough, and they're able to communicate what's happened. What do we do? Do we put them? Do we encourage them to move into, say, this TRE? Well, I mean, this is the sort of thing that you would say, okay. I get where you're coming from. Let's move you into a TRE station and give you a moment to go through these exercises so you can complete the stress response process so you can regulate yourself and move into a position to learn. So I, what I feel at this point is this is one option to reduce anxiety and stress, but it's not to be done alone. I don't want a child to go into an area and say, okay, do this TRE. Because it is, first of all, what we're going to be doing is initiating exercises that are safe. These are not going to feel unsafe to the students. And I'm still working on that. So, Lane, I love your question. I'm just trying to figure out the application for it. Yeah, and I am too. Right. So, <laughs> I, like, no, I appreciate that. And I'm, and I'm looking at this just to see, you know, how, and this is, we are going to be, our graduate class in the fall is going to be really looking into this. And I would appreciate any of your, in, like, if you leave today, you know, I'm thinking, what, what can you share or, like, how did this feel to you? So, I love that. But I do feel this is something to be done with an adult. So, if you have an instructional assistant in your room or you have some one-on-one -on -one time, if you can regulate for you know, a couple of minutes with a student or whole class. I like this to begin the day. You know, this is part of bell work. This is part of how we, you know, just model not only our enthusiasm. And here's something else. How many of us who've been in the gym before, when we start shaking, try to hide that? We don't want people to see. We think of shaking as a weakness. We think of shaking as a sign of I'm not strong enough. And that's really the opposite. So many of our high school students, and you'll, you know, and I, I can't remember which documentary I watched, but that's a mindset that we need to really shift. You know, that shaking, that trembling is a really natural way to heal and repair your body's stress response. So, um, you know, that's something I've been thinking about too, but um, I will, I have this, Doug has created this incredible email list. By the way, if you did not sign this. This is a great, Doug needs your email because we'll be a group and that way, and Doug's putting in these right now so I can send all of this to you. So, Lane, thank you for that question. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's do this. Um, so, Reagan is going to kind of help me and we're going to begin these together, but we, I'm, I'm going to show you before you stand up and I'm going to show you the first four steps and then I'm going to walk you and talk you through this. So the first thing you're going to do is, um, and I'm going to turn off the lights because these lights don't help, but in, you'll have a, I'm going to send to you this afternoon like a typed out list of these steps. And there's a, a video that you can also watch for the longer version. His name is Matt. And he, um, I didn't send it this time because uh, it was just too long to, 
today, but I want you to practice this, and it's got nice music with it. You can do it at home. So you, what you just start doing is you start on your feet, and you start moving side to side 10 to 15 times, just moving back and forth on the sides of your feet. Now remember, the purpose of these exercises are to stress and strain those muscles starting from the feet working all the way up to the sorus muscle. So the, that's the first thing we do like 10 or 15 times is where we're gonna begin to just rock back and forth side to side. Then the next step is when, and you can hold on to something, you're going to take start on one foot 10 to 20, we'll probably do 10 of these today, and you just lift up on your toes. That's all you do. So just you can have support and you just 10 times on each side. Okay, so that's, you doing them immediately. Number three is you're going to use your hands and your legs can stay bent and you, again, honor your body. And if this doesn't feel comfortable, skip this one. But what you do is just lift a leg and try to straighten that one leg as far as you can. And we'll do like 10 or 12 on each side. It doesn't have to be completely straight. You know, it can just be a nice bend. We'll do 10 or 12. So those are the first three. So this, and I'll walk you through toe, and then, to, and we're moving up the leg. That's, that's the third one, okay? Now, the fourth one, and we don't have room today, so I'm going to modify it. Um, the fourth one is when you actually, actually, no, we don't have room. But you're doing a wall sit. Now, you only need to do this for about a minute or two. And if it starts to be painful, you move up the wall a couple of inches. You literally alleviate the pain. Let me tell you, these are strengthening. Not only are we going to reduce your stress, we're going to get you in shape. Yeah. So, and, and you, so if it starts to hurt, then you just you move up two inches. And you do this, I started, when Reagan and I started, I did it four minutes because I, real, I wanted, and now, like yeah, last night, I did this before I went to sleep and I just did it for a couple of minutes and got a nice, you know, a nice tremble. So just a couple of minutes, but we don't, we're not going to do that today. So then, after, so I'm going to walk you through. Then what you're going to do is you're going to spread your, you know, just legs apart and you're going to move your hands. You don't even have to go all the way down. Just go to your right side and take three deep breaths. I'm going to walk you through. Then we're going to go to our left side and take three deep breaths. And then you're going to walk your hands through or just let them, you know, you can bend your legs too. And then you're going to hold here for a couple of deep breaths. And then we're going to get on our backs. Okay? You might, I got a little bit of a tremble just doing this just now. Um, I mean, I could feel, and if you start to straighten your legs, if you kind of play with them, you can see, when I start to see, I'm getting a bit of a tremble in there. And that's, I, that's not because I'm nervous. I'm not nervous now. I was nervous earlier. <laughs> so, um, but I just, um, yeah, so let's play with this. So go ahead and stand up. Uh, that's a great question. I would be barefoot or socks. I think you could have socks on. Uh, but I would just make sure... Um, and I'm going to have Reagan, when we go to the floor, I'll have her just kind of show you on the floor. But um, it's nice to have music too. But let's go ahead and just do, let's just go back and forth 10 or 12 times and take some deep breaths. When I was, I was focusing on this so hard, I forgot to breathe. <laughs> I mean, I was breathing, but I wasn't breathing. <laughs> but just kind of real, just feel, you know, on the sides of your feet. And what you'll find is you may need more or less. You might, everyone's different. This is like your own, you know, you might, you might get that shake, that tremor in a real, you know, faster way. All right, now, so then go to a place, doesn't matter, and then let's go 10. You can find a table or use somebody's shoulder even. You can just be with somebody. And go ahead and lift and do about 10 or 15 on each side. Just lifting your, yeah, just lifting your toe. And after you, so, you know, do your 
10 or 15 on both sides. And breathe. Make sure you take a nice deep breath. Keep breathing deeply. Okay, now we're going to go down and you're going to just square your feet. And you can bend, bend your legs if you want to. And then you're just going to lift one leg behind you. And then just try to bend and straighten. doesn't have to be straightened all the way. Let that nice blood flow. And if it, if it feels painful or feels uncomfortable, just stop. Honor your body. So just do a few bends and breathe deeply. You're getting that nice oxygenated glucose blood flow to your head. And then switch and do a few on that side. It's nice and easy. Ten or fifteen. And then when you come up, slowly raise up. Because you, your head, it, you'll get a, maybe a little lightheaded. Just slowly raise up. And now, what I want you to do is spread your legs apart. And you're going to go down again. Um, and, I get an, and you're going to do three deep breaths on the right. And you don't have to go down very far, just as far as it's comfortable. But take a deep breath. And then take three deep breaths, and then after you do that, walk over to the left and take three deep breaths. And then after you take your deep breaths there, then go through your legs as far as you can and take three deep breaths and try to see if you can get a little tremble as you bend and straighten your legs breathing. So go ahead and do that for a minute. Kind of play with your legs, see if you're... When I bend mine and when I straighten mine, I get a little bit of a tremble. And then slowly raise up. And then take your fists and put them in the small of your back. And just kind of, not back far, but just kind of stretch, put, pushing your pelvis out. So you just kind of stretch. And then look, take, go to your right and breathe deeply and look to your right. Kind of support your back with your fists. Breathe. And then go to your left. Kind of give that a nice back stretch and side stretch. And then come back. And then we're going to get down on our mat or the floor. And then I'm going to show. So what you're going to do is I want you to take your, um, and you don't, the, we, the butterfly is a nice, you know, some of us use that butterfly in yoga or before we work out that butterfly stretch. So you're going to do that, but you're going to lay, you're going to lay down. We're going to be cozy. And you're going to lay down, and you can make a diamond shape. doesn't have to be clear up, but, you, you know, kind of a diamond shape. But just lay down and take a couple of deep breaths in that butterfly pose. Just a couple of deep breaths. Now, we're not going to do the wall stretch, so you may, this where I'm going to work you a little harder here. And if it's uncomfortable, don't do it. Or adjust your legs. And take a couple of deep breaths. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to lift your buttocks off the ground. Everything else is on the ground about three inches. And I want you to hold it and continue to take nice deep breaths. So just hold it. And if it gets, if you get tired, drop it and, and do it again. So do this on your, I mean, follow your body, but try to hold it and I'll time you.
Keep breathing deeply. Go ahead and drop. And take five deep breaths. Now I want you to lift it up again, about three inches, and hold it. And actually, if you can go up this time a little yeah. bit farther, you can kind of just kind of sway your hips back and forth. If you can, just a little teeny bit as your buttocks is up. Just kind of hold it up there. I'm telling you, you guys are going to be in great shape. And breathe. Continue to breathe. Close your eyes. And drop. And just take two deep breaths. Another deep one. And one more lift for one minute. Try to lift it up now, maybe about five, six inches, and just kind of sway back and forth like it's a hammock. And just hold for about a minute. Now, as you're holding, move your knees a little closer together. Maybe move them a couple of inches. And a couple more. Move them closer together, just a couple more inches. Hold it. Now drop. Take a deep breath. Now I want you to take your feet and put them flat on the floor. Move them up to close to your buttocks and relax your legs, relax your knees. And just let your knees hang and breathe deeply. Take two deep breaths. Now I want you to close your knees together and go ahead and lift up one more time with your knees close together. And I just want you to take about five deep breaths holding your buttocks tight with your knees closed. And slowly drop and relax your knees. And just feel that nice, loose. You might have a little shaking, a little trembling. You may have nothing and just enjoy that nice opening of that source muscle. And I just want you to take five or six deep breaths, just relaxing your knees, just letting them fall open. And then as you relax, try to bring them together with your soles on the floor and see if you can get a little trembling. Sometimes when you bring them together, you'll feel trembling. Kind of move them, I'm kind of moving my back and forth and I'm getting a little tremble. And I just want you to feel the weight of your body on the floor. Feel the soles of your feet right where they are, solid. 
Your arms are laying open on the floor. You're in this beautiful container that has the ability to release your anxiety and your stress. And it also has the ability to hold on to it. But through these exercises, you're actually releasing it in a very safe and controlled way. Through those slight body movements and those little tremors, that tremor mechanism through your spinal cord. Take four more deep, deep breaths. Feel your body in this space. You can continue to kind of move your knees back and forth together, feeling that little shake. Take one more deep, deep breath. And then turn on your side. Turn on your side and then lift yourself up on your side. It's much better on your back. Never try to lift up from your back, but just always move to your side and then lift up. Now comes the most important part, and that's reflective time. Did anybody get a little shaking, a little tremor? Raise your hand. Good. Did you get a bunch? I got a bunch. Did you? Good. Good. Did you, Jane? I did not get much today. And just because I've been doing this for seven days in a row and I've been increasing, like, the wall, I, like we didn't do the wall time today. So if you didn't get much today, what I'm going to send to you is some more stretch and strain time so that you'll get that tremor a little bit more. Yesterday, I did it in the afternoon, and I felt the trim, I, like literally my trunk was moving. Not, you didn't see that. But before, I just had my, my legs were moving, and I laid there with music. I mean, it felt, it, I can't tell you how good this feels. And it feels better when you're in the private, you know, in a group. No one, I mean, we all had our eyes closed. No one was looking. But, but it, it can be a vulnerable exercise. So be thinking now with students, you can, they can get a tremor, but they don't even have to lay on their backs. They can get the tremor from just, um, I'll just show you. So the first one is this. The second one is this. And then third one is this. And they can, we can increase it maybe 15 to 20 times on each side. Then the fourth one is legs apart, three breaths, moving back and forth. Every time I straighten my legs, my, my legs, did your legs shake during that? Mm -hmm. A little bit, and I got a nice shake in that. And then when I stretched all the way back, I, you can get a nice tremor. Um, and then if they're comfortable, they can lay on their backs. And this is what, I, this is what you can do is they can lay and they can just move Slightly. See, I'm still getting a little bit of shake. I can feel my muscles right here. I'm getting a little bit of a shake right here. Just on the end, you know, and, and they can even feel. So I'm going to give you the set of exercises, and then I'm going to have you play with that. But the point that I want to make is that it needs to be reflect. So I, I want to finish reflection. How did that feel to you? Could anyone just share? Did it feel uncomfortable? Did it feel weird? Did it feel good? Did it feel weird and good? Weird and good. Because I had a whole bunch of shaking going on. Did you? I darn! I would have loved. I wish I could have seen. I just. I think that's but so. But I'm in a highly stressed state right now. Okay, so it makes sense. It does. Okay, that. It okay. Does. So yeah. you are going through some stress, yeah. and you were able to activate that, and that's from that autonomic nervous system, from that brainstem area that literally takes care of you. And it was amazing when I breathe, like took, when you said do it as take deep breath, when I exhaled, I got more tremors. Did you? As I exhaled. So I was That's like, interesting. <laughs> oh, good. So we'll, you could do this. I mean, this could yeah. be, does this feel like something that you could use for oh, your. personally, yeah. Because this but is what I. the kids. I know, I know. 
And, and that, thank you. And that is what this is for today. I want you to use this next week before classes start or if they start, you know. I mean, I want you to do this for you. Right. So I want you to get that good tremor that you got, that good shake, and just play with this this week. And you will have this information to you I, by tonight. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to get all this. So I'll go through the video and the steps that you can have. But anybody else have like a good experience or not a good experience? Because reflecting with your students is important. Yes. 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 So it's hard to flip my mindset. Yes. It's good to allow that my body to release the stress. Yeah. And I was the same way. You know, just that I, I would get literally, I remember going to Flourish Yoga and getting embarrassed when I was holding boat pose, you know, that's that abdominal and I, my, I mean, my legs were just <laughs> shaking like this. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, that was so cool that I did that. <laughs> Any other, you know, experiences? Yes, Trudy. Okay, Trudy, thank you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so I have to tell you that this is ageless. I mean, I this is, and what you just said, there are testimonials on there that just immediately a 23-year-old young man said, oh my gosh, and then he started talking about the relief of symptoms and, and just, he said, I even woke up and I, his, he said, my chest was open. You know what I mean? He said, I could feel a difference in my posture. So I don't, I don't care if you're 80, 90, I don't care. You can do this and you, you know, modify. So Trudy, thank you. Anybody else? Even if it was a negative experience, don't hesitate to share. It's relaxing. Was it relaxing? Yeah. I don't feel like I got as many tremors, like I'm kind of envious of the people who got a lot of tremors. Yeah. I wasn't getting a lot. Of, so sure. now, am I supposed to, would it be good for me to move into a position that caused more tremors? That's like what I'm saying. Walk. Yes. Like, like yes. go for it and yes. go for the tremors. Go for the tremors. And, they, and that's a good, because I was disappointed too, because I was looking at this and I, but I think part of me, I was holding back. I was so, I had too much of my, frontal lobe into this activity and I wasn't relaxing into it so I was trying too hard and I was thinking okay I'm doing this wrong uh, you know I'm not doing this right so that is a part of that too but reflecting with your students modifying playing with this yourself and, and if I if you leave here in the next 10 minutes I want to be I want to honor your time this is for you because you're, even if I, you know, I look, parenting, grandparenting, um, being a partner, relationship, whatever it is, our health matters so much and it doesn't have to deteriorate. You know, that's the beauty of this, is our, our bodies have this plasticity in our brains, literally. How cool would it be for your students to see this, to see those boys were so excited in that gym, those high school students, because they, you could see their little legs and that brain was doing that. I mean, they were able to do that. So, oh yeah. I'm sorry. To ask no, you. that's right. And I'm going to pull up the strategies while you. I'm still back on the polar bear um, video. And yeah. The stress the polar bear. Was I know. Like, I don't like it very well, much. So, if they had just flown over and given the polar bear all kinds of stress, and then just kept going instead of shooting him, would the polar bear have gone into some mild form of the tremors, you know, unobserved, right? So. The, Meaning. Yeah, was it because he was drug-induced that he was having all the tremors? No. That just halted them temporarily, but the polar bear would have gone through that. The, the polar bear would have gone through that. They, the frozen state is that polar bear was um, sedated. And, 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 you know, and then it, it literally, so they, it was a synthetic or activated frozen state. But no matter the stress response, animals, you can see zebras do this in the wild, they shake and they tremor to release that anxiety. So um, very, very important. Yes? How, it, I mean, is there a, should you um, <coughs> tremble for a long period of okay, time? Okay, thank do you. you. Let it to stop or okay, you then, to oh my gosh, I always forget the most important things. You can tremble for a half hour. I'm going to tremble that long. The, the, now that I was so nervous about today, I'm going, to, I'm going to do this when I get home later this afternoon. And I'm going to put on some music. 
He says 30, you can do it 30 minutes, you can do it five minutes, you can do it two minutes. Get your trimmers going and here, you know how you stop them? I should have told you that. <laughs> there is a way to stop these. And I, it is the, so I tried this, so here's how you stop it. When your legs are up and you've done this and you know, cause I literally, I'm gonna show you right now, I get this much trembling. I mean, I can, I literally get this tremble and I put one leg down and this leg still is going a little bit. I experimented, but all you do to stop it is just to straighten your legs and it stops immediately. There is not any hesitation. It is the coolest thing. Yeah. So thank you because I forgot to share. You'd be trembling till I saw you. Didn't Lord, what happened? I'm still trembling. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, any other questions? Let me take your questions. Any, any, or observations or thought? Yes. Just that kind of observation. I yeah. noticed that you kept using the word vulnerable, and I like that because Dr. S says it, that like a lot of our kids are victims of <laughs> abuse or something like that. Yep. So if you come upstairs, and she always says it's like the safe place, like upstairs education is a safe place. So I think this is really going to be good to implement, and then they can feel vulnerable and kind of move through that throughout the day and then experience that and then with the stressors of the downstairs programming. I love that. It would be really cool to implement and see how that works out. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And some of the positions, you know, like open leg, you know, butterfly is a natural position. We use it, you know, to warm up. Athletes use it to stretch. It's a stretching exercise. But for many students, especially those middle school brains, it might look sexual, you know, it might look inappropriate. Um, and so I'm a, I, I just, I was, in my mind, as I was like thinking about this this week, I was just thinking, you know, what, you know, what can, how can we make modifications? But I, you know, I like that. And that's why, you know, just giving them the, the information and the awareness is critical. You can't just go in and say, we're going to do tree. Because, I mean, just like tapping or focused attention practices, there's no... They have to buy in to that. And, and your enthusiasm and your join up with them is just critical. So I like that. Yeah. Um, my class, we do classroom yoga. And so it resembles a lot of the stuff that we do in classroom yoga. But it seems like something, this would be a good thing to do right after recess. Yes. To bring them down. Yes. And get ready for the afternoon. Or even as you're getting ready to go home. Home. Yeah. Getting on the bus. Yeah. No, I like that, and what? I, yeah, I had a meeting at the lab school yesterday, and someone was saying to come in from recess, they need something, but yoga by itself isn't doing it because they're so hot and sweaty and they're wound up, and so just to hold a pose is kind of annoying to some of the students. So this, I think, would be good, this or tapping. I, and those of you who would like to know more, you can email me. I put these strategies up here today, but I really wanted today to focus on um, tree. But these are the strategies that I'm using this year. You've, there's another page of these. And what we know, too, is that because trauma is held in the right hemisphere, um, we also know that if a child or adolescent is reaching that point of no return, but they haven't reached it yet, if even your own children, you know, just trying this with your own children, holding, like I'm right now, what is your first name again? Stacy. Stacy. So Stacy doesn't realize it, but I'm using this strategy with her right now. And, and then I'll, sorry, honey. And then I'll get on her level. And so I'm talking to you and I want to thank you for coming today. This was so much fun. And so as I'm talking to her, I'm using my left eye and I'm holding her left eye. And her left eye went to my left eye immediately, <coughs> which activates right hemisphere to right hemisphere, which emotionally regulates a child. Has, Walt, have you tried that? Yes. Yes. Have you seen results? Have you seen anything it's yet? Startling. Really? It's, it's startling. And, and it, it kind of surprised me the first time I tried that on, on a young person because they, I, I would describe them as moth-like. And when I went left eye, left eye, on the level in a calm, mm -hmm. supportive tone, yeah. Does that work? Yes. 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 Autistic children on the spectrum have very similar characteristics to PTSD 
And I'm hoping the DSM-5 now will recognize the childhood stress disorder, calling that developmental um, trauma disorder. Um, but children on the spectrum can carry a lot of anxiety and a lot of tension. And their sensory systems sometimes are understimulated or overstimulated. So these techniques for our beautiful brains that are on the spectrum are very regulating too. So um, that's that great, you know, very good question. And so these today, um, left eye to, you know, um, looking at these strategies, the two by 10 is staying connected to a student. Um, you pick your top three who are most vulnerable. And for two minutes, 10 days in a row, you make a healthy connection and talk with them about anything that's of interest. And the research um, is very, very strong with regard to that. Um, hugging yourself. Um, I love, this is, we're doing visualizations in our focused attention practice. And so having a child hugging themselves and shrinking at, what was the movie with the, sh the little, pe they shrunk and, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Okay, I loved that movie. And so I was thinking, you know, to kind of picture, you could even show a video clip of that and then they shrink and, you know, and, and then um, you can do a, a focused attention and they land um, in, in their own hearts. So giving affirmations for mistakes. We're having students identify their triggers the minute school begins this, this year because it's just like anything else when you know what really, you know, frustrates you and irritates you, then that gives us more information as counselors, social workers, and, and educators. So there's a whole nother page, but I want to be very, I want to honor your time. So I have to take your picture. You have, I just have to take a picture. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Because, and you know, you can always email me. You can text me. I'm going to send you more information than you'll ever need. I would really love for you to share, say, Lori, this is really working, or Lori, I'm thinking about modifying it this way because I want to share with everybody. So this is brand new. That's why I wanted to meet with you today. I can't thank you enough for being here today. Thank you. Okay, don't move. I have to take your picture. Where's my, where's my phone? Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, Ray, can you take our picture? And then I'll, okay, I'll just sit down here. Uh, Chris, come in. Yeah, come in. We got to get everybody. I'm so, it's so good to see you. I know. You. I, know. <laughs> I, have, I have missed right. being at Marion. I know you're not there anymore, but, I you know, know, just that group. I know. You need to sit on the chair or something? Um, I think, I think it's a can you go, can right. you get us? One, two, three. Tree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to take one more this way so we can get everybody. Oh, that's that panorama. <laughs> okay. Thank Yay. you. Thanks, you guys, so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It was so funny what you said about autism and post-traumatic. Dr. Ivy taught me that. The witch, Dr. Ivy Bond. She did she teach you. Me. That's so, I've got to meet.